Greetings, my friends. This is the brain of TV's Pinky in the Brain, and you are listening to This Week in Geek with Mike, the Birdman Dodd, and the rest of the Twig crew. Twigs. Come to think of it, Pinky, I have not used Twigs in any of my latest plans for world domination. If this works, then Mike and the crew will rule by my side. Yes! Did you grow up with the NES PlayStation? Star Wars cartoons in any TV? Do you like to think who would win in a fight between Batman and the Master Chief? Comics, games, movies, music, and TV. They're gonna tell you everything you need. Superheroes or not, they got your back. They're gonna save the world of geeks. What's going on? You are listening to This Week in Geek, and I'm your host, Mike the Birdman Dodd. Well, guys, it's finally here. It's coming to an end. I no longer get to talk to porn stars. God damn it. But anyway, though, over the last month, we've had a lot of fun. We've talked with Jesse Jane, Caden Cross, Riley Steele, and we're going to end things off with Stoya, who... Like I said, it's, it's cool to talk to a person who only has a single name. So I can now say I've talked to someone like Bono and Madonna. I don't know how incredibly lame that sounds. Let's just say it sounds kind of cool, though. But uh, so Stoy is one of the is one of the other really cool girls over at uh, DigitalPlayground.com. And uh, I got introduced to her via the PR people over there. And as I've been talking with all the girls over at Digital Playground, the whole gag this month has been to talk about everything except porn. Because, you know, these guys are people, too. They have interests. And some of them are even closet nerds. Like, I had no idea Riley Steele loved Resident Evil. That completely came out of left field. So, without any further ado, I'd like to welcome D- Digital Playground's very own Stoya. Welcome to the show. Hello. So, Stoya, when we tried to do this interview the first time, let's give some people some context here. Um, Armageddon decided to come to Ontario and upstate New York. We had earthquakes well, and tornadoes. If you if you really want the play-by-play, what happened was at around 2 p.m., I got an email from the press people at Digital saying, blah, blah, whoever needs to reschedule. And I'm like, grr, really? <laughs> Because I don't, I don't know if you're aware of this, but the media loves to make adult entertainers sound like flakes. Oh. If you are five minutes late, if something goes slightly off, they will blow it out of proportion and make you sound like a bumbling lunatic. So when the press flakes on me, I, I tend to take it somewhat personally. So I'm like, really? Like, WTF, man. <laughs> so then I, I, went into Twitter, and I saw that you had Twittered about how there are tornadoes. You know, tornadoes are actually a legitimate excuse for (laughs) rescheduling an interview. That I understand. (laughs) And I sent you a a snarky tweet, and then then you came back with, P.S. there are now earthquakes. (laughs) (laughs) And I couldn't believe this all happened within, like, a one-hour period. I'm like, geez, I'm really sorry I rescheduled, God. Don't worry, I'll try. (laughs) (laughs) You would think after banging the uh, the Antichrist superstar for a few months there that God would actually be against me. Yeah, and just <laughs> not fig- on my side. There you go. He didn't want us to talk, but ha, I've given God. I, you know what? I'm just not going to fish that sentence less. You know, a meteor fall on my house. I've had weirder stuff happen. <laughs> yes, so be careful with that one. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, like I said, we finally get a chance to um, kind of talk now. And you see, I, I don't get why the mainstream media is so up in arms against adult stars because I've had a fantastic time talking with people like Jesse, Riley, and Raven. Like you guys are all tremendously cool people. So to all it's, you, it's because they want a story. I don't know if you've read much Terry Pratchett 
Mm -hmm. with his theory of stories. Um, I think it was the first book that was set in Uberwald where he started talking about, you know, there's very few stories in the world and all other stories fit those stories. And I really, I see the same thing in the press. They, or even with people that I interact with, like they, they want to meet you, fit you into a category, take whatever few details they get and stick you in, okay, it's, it's this story or it's this story. So the press for so long, they, they only did stories about borderline retarded adult performers who aren't capable of doing anything else with their lives and can't properly function or are so pumped full of drugs and alcohol that they can't function and everything's a mess and everything's terrible and it's falling apart and it's so tragic because if something had changed in this person's childhood then they'd be a functioning adult like the rest of society and that's the story that they want to write because that story is easy. It's already been written and you just have to plug in the pertinent details for each girl. So that's, that's why they do that. Wow. Rather than take the time to actually look at us as individuals that may or may not have chosen to do porn because they wanted to. And you see, that's sort of been the whole thing. Why I wanted to, why I wanted to do the interviews with the girls at Digital Playground is because you guys are people too, and I don't. And like I said, I, and like you just said, you guys don't get a fair shake in the media. So this is my middle finger to the mainstream media, saying, "Hey, these guys are cool too." So, like I said, thank you for agreeing to do this. And just in the last ten minutes we've been talking, you're definitely not any of the of the kind of stereotypes. And as I've been reading more and more about you you're more and more like us nerds than we probably realize, and that's what makes you fascinating to talk to. You just happen to have a really cool job that we wish we had. (laughs) (laughs) So I guess let's get started at the beginning of the beginning, the long, long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. How did you, or basically, where did you grow up, and how did you find yourself into the weird and wacky ward of pornography? Well, I... I mostly grew up in various parts of North Carolina and Delaware. When I was almost 16, or maybe a few months after I turned 16, I moved to Philadelphia because I had already finished high school and it was the, the state of Delaware wasn't really down with homeschooling yet. It was a very small state, um, and I guess they never had someone go through homeschooling and finish before they went through the driver's ed process. Mm -hmm. So long story short, I wasn't going to be able to get a driver's license until I was 18, which doesn't really work if you're in the suburbs. Um, Because it's it's one thing for me to be like, okay, you know, so I could – I was also taking – insane amounts of dance lessons at the time. So it's like, well, you know, I'm at home, I do my schoolwork, I walk to the studio because it's close enough, whatever. But when it was time to get a job, because I was out of school and that's the next step, um, it just wasn't going to happen without a car because it's not like my mom was sitting around with her thumb up her butt, like, I just (laughs) wait to drive my daughter places. She had a career. So I I moved to Philadelphia because I could get around on the public transportation system or walk because it's a city. So I moved up there. Um, I had I had normal jobs for a while. They weren't particularly interesting or fulfilling, but they were okay. And then I met I met this fantastic man named Tommy. He was a promoter in Philadelphia. He he did a lot of parties at nightclubs, a lot of advertising work for venues. Um, when it was when it was time to launch a new brand of liquor or cigarettes, that's when they started doing the regional marketing. He's one of the people that they would go to. So I I started working for him as his personal assistant, and it was very interesting. And then when I was 18, I was able to start working in the nightclubs, like helping him with that. And that was also very interesting. 
and I was and I was very young, and I was hanging out kind of in the party scene. And there were so many fascinating people, and I um, I ended up one of the people that I met in that in that time was a photographer as as a hobby, and a couple of like the the alternative girl community websites that are similar to Suicide Girls. Mm-hmm. Um, it was God's Girls and Razor Dolls. They they contacted a friend and they were like, we want you to take pictures for us. We'd like you to work for us. And she's like, sweet. Um, what, what girls do you want me to shoot? And they're like, uh, well, we kind of thought you would have girls. Hmm. Who do I know? Who do I know that is attractive and would not be averse to running around naked in front of a camera? <laughs> hey! <laughs> he, he comes out of his bedroom, and I'm I'm on the couch with my laptop and, like, little booty shorts, because I would also go-go dance sometimes. Um, and, like, a fishnet shirt with one Band-Aid still on one of my nipples, because you have to keep them covered, and whatever, <laughs> laid out. And he's like, how do you feel about being naked? I'm like, gosh, Johnny, I don't know. How do I feel about being naked? <laughs> like, well, you seem pretty okay with it, which leads to the next question. How do you feel about being naked on camera? Like, this is going to take, we, we got to think about this. It's going to take some thought. So we thought about it. And what we decided was let's take, the pictures, let's like shoot a day's worth of nude sets and see what we get. Um, Because if it's no good, then obviously they're not going to go anywhere. And we can, we can sit on it and I can, I can think like, okay, now that I've done this, how do I feel about people seeing these and all that? And I trusted him to get rid of them if I was unhappy with it. But we went and we did the shoot, and it was actually a lot of fun. And people liked the pictures, and they liked them so much that that kind of became my job. I was I was making enough money and um, and busy enough with it that I didn't really have to have a real job anymore, mm-hmm. which was pretty nifty. And then. Um, at some point, at some point, Digital Playground asked me to come into their office because they wanted me to do a scene with Sophia Santi. I don't know if you know who she is. But I I just saw gorgeous. her. Oh yeah, I would agree. <laughs> she's so beautiful. So I was, of course, of course, I would love to have sex with this woman. Bonus points if you're going to videotape it and then pay me for the privilege of videotaping <laughs> it, like. I am all about that. So the scene with Sophia actually never really happened because once they got me in the office, they're like, well, how do you feel about boys? Like, boys are okay. Like, how do you feel about having sex with boys on camera? I'm going to have to think about that. And I went home and I thought. And I thought about the repercussions that it would have for my future. I thought about the things that it would limit me from. Um... I I weighed the perceived risks and benefits, and it's like it came back maybe a week or two later. It's like, okay, let's go, hmm. let's do this, and they put me under contract. So um, now, so now that you've been working with like with like kind of digital playground, and you've had all these really cool experiences. I mean, like like uh, it says here in your bio, you've been signed for three years exclusively. What was it like in that first three years to be signed to one of the biggest porn companies around? Like I said, you said uh, you, this may kind of limit you, but we've seen a lot of stars make the kind of crossover into the mainstream. So what's what was one of the coolest moments in the first three years? Well, see, when I signed that contract, I had no clue that Digital Playground was as big as they were. Um, they They sat there and they said, like, you know, oh... This is going to be great for your career. We're going to make you a star, blah, blah. And I'm like, I did not fall off the turn of tricks yesterday. The man that I buy my cigarettes from every morning tells me he can make me a star. This is Los Angeles. Yeah, sure, whatever. Um, and then the first, my first year at the AVN show, 
that's when it hit me. <laughs> oh, you guys are kind of a huge deal. <laughs> what have I gotten myself into? Um, so it was, it was mostly the first two years were just trying to play catch up and learn how to cope with the fact that I thought I was signing up to do 25 sex scenes a year and maybe pose for some nude shoots for the the spank mags and that was going to be it and I was going to have all this free time to to like sew and work on things and learn stuff and all that kind of all that kind of thing and that is not how it was it was interviews and all of a sudden all these people who saw my work wanted to be friends with me on MySpace and then on Twitter and whatever. And when they're talking to me, I feel like it's really rude to not respond. Mm. So um, it was it was basically just two years of trying to cope with. I, I did not sign up to be pseudo-famous and <laughs> did not sign up for all this attention. Now I have some sort of responsibility to, like, uphold a public image and respond to fans it was very um very interesting (laughs) now now kind of being thrust into this huge kind of spotlight what has been the funnest moment of being a famous adult film star like i've talked with like with like jesse jane i think it was and she told me a story how she got stopped when they were doing a big tour bus thing and they had that this woman brought her kids over and like, Hey, come meet the famous people. So have you had any weird or funny experiences being famous? I've had lots of really weird experiences. Um, there was a guy who would leave things on my doorstep. <laughs> there was one, and I'm pretty sure that this is a different one who, um, when I was living in Philadelphia. He would, Every day, every day that I was home, he would send me a message that said, you know, I really liked the green color that you were wearing today. It was much more flattering than the 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 red plaid dress that you were wearing last week when I saw you, and it was freaking terrifying. Um, (laughs) Yeah, there was there was one. I was in Japan, and I was I was traveling with a friend who's a musician. And somebody had figured out that the shows that he was playing would be a good place to find me. So I'm in Japan, and there's a man running amok backstage trying to track down Stoya. Wow. <laughs> like, it's, it's just completely insane because I am <clears throat> I'm not that big of a deal. Like, porn is perhaps the list in the grand scheme of famous people. Like, it is not that much of a thing, but something about something about the nature of that industry and the way that it's marketed really when people are fans, it makes them extremely dedicated sometimes. Um sometimes to a point where you start to fear for your safety. And then refuse to live by yourself ever again. Um, <laughs> but I really I I really enjoy the the positive feedback and knowing that I'm doing my job well and that's why people are so into it. But other than that, I would very much prefer not to be famous. <laughs> <laughs> now, have you ever had any unexpected perks of like kind of being famous? I mean, maybe getting non creepy fan mail or something like that. Uh, I have. I have. I would really call them more friends because even though we met because they appreciated my work, we, we like discuss things like books or things like that and have like actual conversations. And they, they seem to talk to me like I'm actually a a real human being and more than a sex symbol on a pedestal. So I've, I've, met friends from that and there's there's a couple of them who send me books which is really nice because they have good taste in things like science fiction and literature and then that saves me the trouble of having to find them myself um but i mean really you you kind of have to wonder 
because people, like pretty young girls, people just do things for pretty young girls. Mm-hmm. I do things for pretty young girls. <laughs> <laughs> I don't give a flying rat ass who you are. If you are a pretty young girl, I am probably going to be much nicer and accommodating to you. <laughs> <laughs> you do kind of wonder, like, is it... Is it because of is it because of the industry that they're in, or is it just because they're really freaking hot, and it's hard to say no to people that are hot? Yeah, it's it's definitely been one of those things because it's so hard to be n- not nice to someone who's really pretty. I mean, you could call me a creep, and I'm like, yeah, that's fine. <laughs> now, yeah. <laughs> Now, uh, one of the things that I've been kind of reading about your bio, and you've been kind of dropping hints during the whole interview, you seem to have a little bit of a nerd side to you. I mean, like, you seem to know sci-fi. I mean, you've been dropping stuff like that. And according to your bio, you're a bit of a tech person. So uh, I guess I'm going to challenge your nerd cred if if you all well, it, allow me to. It's not so much that I am a tech person. My dad worked in information technology. So when I was a kid, it was like, I'm like two or three, and my mom's starting to teach me the alphabet, and my dad is teaching me how to use a keyboard and navigate DOS. So I just grew up with it. Um, the first the first PDAs, like, I remember having my hands on one like 15 years ago, or maybe longer, and the thing was pretty much the size of my laptop now, <laughs> but... <laughs> Like I've just I've just grown up always being exposed to the new technology and how it can make your life more efficient and easier. So I just naturally want to see what it's about and incorporate it in my life. It's useful. Now to kind of go along that, um, what do you think about the way the adult industry has embraced tech in the last couple of years? Because there's a lot of social media and like live it streams. Has not. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but it is not embraced in the past couple of years. It has always been an integral part of the success of the adult industry. And I, I firmly believe that the adult industry as an early adopter has sometimes pushed new technology to the point where it helps it catch. Um, it's, the, the Adult Entertainment Expo used to be held in a corner of the Consumer Electronics Show years ago. Mm-hmm. Like, they just, it's, it's a natural thing. When, when photography was invented, one of the first things that was photographed was Pablo Vivant of nude women or people engaged in graphic sexual acts. As soon as there is a technology, it's used to depict adult entertainment and that's because sexuality and sexual release is one of the most basic human desires and needs that's we're programmed to find food engage in sex for the end purpose of propagating the species but also because it chemically provides stress relief and relaxation and if if people are in an environment where they need things like houses and clothes to cover themselves to handle that. And of course now it's become like a societal norm of modesty, Mm -hmm. but that's, I mean, immediately it's either going to be things are going to be used for food and for having sex and for keeping safe from the elements, how humans are programmed. Now, what do you think has been the biggest contribution to technology the adult industry has um, kind of given? VHS. Yeah, because like because that kind of pushed out um, uh, Betamax, right? Yes. Now- the, the adult industry went with VHS. They saw an opening where... Now, adult entertainment could be had in one's home, or adult films could be had in one's home instead of having to go to a theater where you risk running into your neighbors or something. So they invested money in VHS tapes. They were buying VHS tapes, making VHS tapes, and I think that gave them the the little bit of economic push that they needed to get over the edge. Now, what 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 influence do you think the adult industry has on the kind of future 
of technology when it comes to kind of home video and streaming services. There was a story that was in the news uh, several weeks ago that uh, Vivid Entertainment wanted to put adult content onto the PlayStation 3 network, and they said no. Do you think adult entertainment will come to North American consoles like it has over in Japan and and in Europe? Honestly, I'm not sure, because what's happening now is the relatively puritanical American culture is pushing at the at the same time as they're embracing things like Miley Cyrus, who is not even eighteen, refusing to wear underwear and having crotch shots taken while she's getting out of car. They're trying to push adult entertainment out. Um, so I'm. I'm not sure because that's that's going to depend a lot on who is in power in the government and regulating things and what what the companies decide and if the adult industry can uh, I I don't even know because it's not like without going so far into lewdness purely for shock value. Mm -hmm. I really don't know what the adult entertainment industry can do to compete with the the already sex saturated culture. Now, actually, now here's a question I just thought of while like while like you were talking there. Do you think the North American culture is becoming more and more friendly towards the adult industry. And I ask that because we have seen mainstream crossovers like Jesse Jane's been in a couple movies and now Riley Steele is doing Piranha 3D. And even you yourself have participated in a, like on a film festival. So do you think things are becoming a little bit better out there? I don't, I don't think that I would necessarily say better because it's definitely like raunch culture happened starting a few years ago. And I think that's led to the embracing of certain adult stars for parts that are already extremely sexualized in mainstream movies. Um, ugh. <laughs> I personally, I wanted to do porn and I'm actually not very excited about the way that it's, it's become so nice and fluffy. Um, Hmm. like, like when I, when I go into a scene and I do what, feels right at the time and it ends up being like foul and dirty and so far that they just cut chunks of it out or have to blur parts because there is so much attention going onto those films and because they're being put in hotels and things like that where people aren't necessarily like looking for dirty, filthy, raunchy movies, I, I kind of resent it. <laughs> like, I, I think, I almost think that pornography had more, I, I hesitate to say creative freedom, but I almost think the pornography had more freedom to be what it dirty yeah. and pornographic before all of this attention was on it. Like, there's, I'm, um, I'm supposed to be preparing my first script to um, to direct with digital, and I sent a treatment that was something that I really wanted to do, and the owners came back with, we, we can't do this. Like, so many people will see it, and people are bound to be very offended, and we cannot take the risk of going to jail for obscenity. And if, wow. this, if this was the 70s or even the 80s, I would have been allowed to do it. And it would have been no problem. Now, because nobody saw that kind of material unless they were really looking for it. Now, 
what do you mean ups- like being charged with obscenity? That's something I've never encountered before while I've been doing these interviews. Can you explain that a little bit more? Well, what what happens with obscenity and what's happening with that right now is ob- obscenity does not have a clear definition. Obscenity is judged by a jury of your community. And where it gets really tricky now is, like, if if I made a film or a set of photographs in Los Angeles or in New York City, my peers wouldn't be offended. Mm-hmm. They might think it's a little edgy or maybe a little too far, but they wouldn't be absolutely incensed and morally upset by it. But now... Now all of this goes on the internet and it's everywhere. So someone someone in the middle of Iowa or the middle of the Bible Belt <laughs> can see it and take offense to it and then you can be charged for obscenity and tried by a jury of not your peers, of people that are almost from an entirely different culture. Wow. And if they deem that it's obscene, then you still get in trouble for it. And that's, (laughs) all of that is basically why, (laughs) why I kind of resent the, um, the, the rise of porn as an acceptable thing because they're not accepting all of it. And at the same time, it's, it's it's very strange because it's either it's either people think like oh porn and it's nice and cute and fluffy and it's just vaginal missionary style sex and it's just like I have sex or people think oh porn and it's all getting your face pissed on and like puking on people's cocks and shit everywhere and like whatever and people are still refusing to acknowledge that there are a broad spectrum of sexual acts and people are into different things and perhaps perhaps you're really into being choked and beaten but you don't want to get peed on and that's awesome or perhaps you're into body fluids but you're not into any sort of roughness or perhaps you really just want to have missionary style sex and gaze lovingly into each other's eyes. And all of that is okay and wonderful. And if you normally do one thing, but you want to try and explore other things, that's great too. Or if you, if with one partner you're into certain things and with another partner you're into an entirely different set of things because that's how your chemistry is with that individual person. Um, and I feel, I feel like the way that it's being presented now as, as an industry is like, it's either this or it's that, like either you're super, super couples friendly or you're the filthiest girl ever. (laughs) I had no idea. (laughs) It's it's very boxing. People like to put things in little boxes and it drives me nuts. And I know that it will always be that way. And I'm just going to have to accept it. But um, I think that's I think that's a lot of why I struggle with the small amount of public notoriety that came with being a digital player on Contract Star and winning Best New Starlet at EVN and all that kind of thing. It's like, oh great! Now instead of having fun and doing what I want to and what I feel is interesting. Every little thing I do is blown out of proportion, and now there's like all these articles where it's like, Straya, Ghost Girl Next Door, Straya, Couples Friendly Feminist, Straya, Raunchy as Hell, and Filthy as All Fuck. And it's like, <laughs> well, what, can, can we accept that like as a, as a human being who's growing and changing and also like living, I can be all of those things? At, at various different turns, and can we accept that everybody is like that? <laughs> like, I've just got to say, I've never 
in all the interviews I've done with the adult industry, this is probably probably the most passionate I've ever heard someone talk about, not just that porn is a job, but to you, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, this is genuinely an art and fun to you. And it's really, really fascinating to hear just the way that you talk about this. So thank you for opening up like that. That's one of the best answers I've ever gotten as an interviewer. Thank you. Yeah, just <laughs> holy shit. I had no idea that the that the adult industry was like this and people felt like this. I mean, I and 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 I guess it is, I mean, it's the same in the kind of mainstream uh film industry too. I mean, either accept all of it or don't. I had no idea the same struggle was going on in the adult industry. It blows my mind. It really does. <laughs> Well, it's, I mean, it's, it's an industry and it's a creative industry, just like any other one it really is. Like there, there are so many similarities with the music industry and I'm sure so many with the, the mainstream movie industry as well, because you have, you have these people who are, they're, they're very into what they're doing. And that passion is what makes what they do great. But at the same time, you have you have the business types that they, all right, we need this product now. <laughs> like, oh, here's the product. What are you doing? We can't sell this. <laughs> we need you to do more of this. And one, one of the things that I find really fascinating is sort of the, the symbiotic relationship between the two. Because I can be a petulant child sometimes. <laughs> like, I'm like, man, screw you, digital. You don't understand me. <laughs> like, <laughs> what the fuck? And then they come back with like, okay, now listen. <laughs> Here's why we're doing this. Because regardless of what you're doing, we're a business. <laughs> like, we're putting money into this, and we need to make money out of it. <laughs> it's, it's such an interesting I don't want to listen. <laughs> Man, I, 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 I guess as one of my final questions on the uh, adult industry, I mean, considering the past uh, 10 minutes on this, where do you see the future of the adult industry going considering current trends? I really have no idea. Um, I, I would like to think that what will happen is the adult industry will smarten up and continue the work towards safety standards that AIM started in the late 90s and continue to try to make working adult entertainment safer. Um, and I would like to think that we will, we will return to being an actual community that you know, tries, tries to support each other. And I would like to think that it, it will continue to be a profitable industry for the businesses that are in it so it can continue functioning, especially the, the high-end companies where it's like the, the work has actual aesthetic value. I'd like to think that, that would continue. But there's also the chance that we're going to sit on our butts until OSHA shuts us down and then it's going to scatter. And the, the obscenity cases will continue to be prosecuted and the government will continue to use other things like um, audits by the IRS and 2257 paperwork, which is really only supposed to be to prevent child pornography but they use it to regulate the entire adult industry and keep it on a leash. Um, it's, I mean, there's a possibility that all of those things will continue to get worse, in which case, frankly, I would probably finish out my contract with digital and then do something completely wacky, like try to set up a company in some sort of Eastern European place where they don't try to litigate the pants off of everyone who does anything edgy and interesting wow so i hope the adult industry in this country and in this continent stays on a good course but uh i mean 
I I really don't know what to say. I mean, I I had no idea there was this amount of politics and other things kind of going on in this industry. I mean, it's amazing just how fascinating it is and how corporate it is. It's it's ridiculous, but uh, kind of makes my next question seem kind of moot because we've had this really intense discussion, and I want to ask about <laughs> video games. God. Wait well, let's switch <laughs> to a fun gear then. <laughs> <laughs> so, like I said, I, I wanted to call out your kind of nerd cred. You've got the film cred down. I will never question you again. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, we've, we're have a couple of weeks out of E3, and I understand you got a thing for um, kind of video games. So, what did you think? That of- is incorrect. <laughs> oh, damn it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, someone someone sent me... One of the one of the old press people at Digital sent me to do an interview with this video game website, and I'm like, "Listen, computers, all about it. The spiffy new smartphones. I always have the most awesome one I can get my hands on. Like, you want to talk about Sid Meier games or Heroes of Might and Magic? I am on it. But if you have to use one of those weird controllers and like have a special video game system for it, I just don't have the time." So they sent me to do this interview anyway, and in the interview, I basically said the same thing, (laughs) and then it got kind of reposted a few times with video gamer, porn star, story, blah, 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 and then didn't actually, like, nobody read the interview, so they just, like, gamer, and I can I can totally point you at girls that are, um, like for instance Raven Alexis, yep. one of the other digital playground contract stars. She is so into that stuff. She plays like World of Warcraft and all that. But I really I like my books. Um, I just finished reading John Scalzi's the uh, the Old Man's War series mm-hmm. and Jennifer Government. <laughs> Those were very interesting. I'm reading J.G. Ballard's Crash right now, which isn't so much science fiction, but I really think that it inspired a lot of Chuck Palahniuk's rant, which kind of is science fiction. So, <laughs> like, I get super into that stuff, but when it comes to the video games, it's like, well, there's only so many hours in the day, and... Yeah, that's priority. Well, all right then. So let's change the gears then. So you you did mention smartphones and stuff like that. By the time on the day we're actually recording this interview, thousands upon hundreds of thousands of people have lined up around Apple stores around the country to get the iPhone four. What do you think? I ooh, I used to love Steve Jobs. I used to think that him and his company were the most fantastic set of things in the entire world. I actually have the power button that was on my uh, my power book tattooed on the back of my head. I was that into it, <laughs> but now now with the censorship that he's he's doing with like for instance the the publication system for the iPad the the fashion magazines can't even show nipple. Like that's that is insane. Nipples in fashion are nothing. It's like they don't even exist. It's just oh, like the designer wanted to make the garment look like this and flow this way and that part happened to be sheer and it exposes a nipple, but who gives a shit because the garment looks fantastic. It's not it's not a sexualized nipple. Um and the fact that he is taking the censorship that far, I'm I'm not sure what I'm going to do when my my heir dies. But um, I'm not sure if I really want to give him any more of my money. <laughs> wow. I have I have an Android based phone. Mm-hmm. I have um I have the G1 still, but I'm really trying to find a way to get the incredible on the T-Mobile service. I don't think they offer it yet, but 
there's got to be a way. <laughs> if someone out there from T-Mobile is listening, come on, help her out. She's pretty. Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, Stoya. Please, I'll give you free porno. <laughs> See, come on. How can you say no to that, realistically? Uh, <laughs> well, Stoya, I definitely got to thank you for taking the time out of your day. This was such a, a very cool comp. Con- conversation I've I've had to uh, have with you today. So thank you so much. Um, if people want to thank find you, if people want to find out more about you, where would they have to go on the web? You know, I'm going to say twitter.com slash Stoya is the best place to start because everything I do, I post about there. Um, I have, I have blogs in a couple of places. I, I post articles for intermittently, but that's Twitter. Twitter is definitely the hub. Well, guys, you can definitely find that on this episode post. Like I said, it's definitely worth following Stoya because you don't know what she's going to say next. So, um, like I said, thank you so much, guys. That was my interview with Digital Playground Stoya. I did not expect any of that to come out. And I got to say, that's probably one of the coolest interviews I've done this year. Good luck to the next guy trying to top that. That's all I got to say. So anyway, guys, I am out of here for this edition of This Week in Geek. And uh, as I'm often fond of saying whenever I sign off, live free or die hard. And I'll catch you guys again next time right here on This Week in Geek on thisweekingeek.net. Want to see me make bubbles with my spit? Sure do. In fact, that's the theme of our next show. So don't miss it. What the hell happened to George Lucas? Remember, kids, buy pizza, pay with snakes. <laughs> What's your social media business card? My fist. Just give me a big box of beef. Don't give them ideas. <laughs> Don't forget our other twig project. George Lucas has <laughs> lost, lost his mind. Dot com. Does Jesus have matrix powers? I think the Pillsbury Doughboy is albino. Uh, I'd like to see a cat on Tourette's. That's the moment I give up on life. Because then I don't know what to believe in anymore. When the Amish start twittering, I'm done. Can we leave this subject alone? (laughs) Hello. I can feel it coming in the air tonight. Oh no. Hi, Chris. How are you? I'm confused. <laughs> As you can imagine, they they don't let us out much. You've been listening to This Week in Geek. Tune in next week to hear Kyle Bear say... Today, the world. Tomorrow, the universe. Next week, my chiropractor. Ay, my back. Check out our website, thisweekingeek.net, for more geek content, as well as subscribe to our podcast through iTunes or any podcatcher. If you'd like to comment about this episode, head to this episode post on thisweekingeek.net and comment through Facebook Connect. Or you can also call our voicemail line at 817-717-7202 or email us at feedback at thisweekingeek.net. This extra music was produced by perpetualemotionmachine.ca. We'll see you next time, and remember, lower your shields and surrender your listenership.